Hi, this is your host, Abhilin Bharti, and welcome to a brand new episode of TFR Newsroom. And today we have with us once again, Julian Fisher, CEO and founder of NNIS. Julian, it's great to have you on the show. It's great to be here. If I'm not wrong, a few days ago, uh, the Cloud Foundry uh, community, you know, you folks, folks hosted uh, Cloud Foundry Days in Heidelberg. Uh, talk a bit about uh, the event, the focus. Well, after so many years in Cloud Foundry, in the Cloud Foundry ecosystem, it was it was just great to see you know, uh, this year's uh, Cloud Foundry Day, it, it was a special event to me. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to find the right words to describe it, but I would say it's, it's grown a very new uplifting spirit. It, is, it has been the best Cloud Foundry event I've, I've been attending to in, in, in quite a while. Um, you know, the spirit of the event was very, very uplifting and uh, the conversations uh, I had uh, were as well. So after, you know, that Kubernetes trauma has happened and has affected the Cloud Foundry community for a while, I now have the feeling that the community has healed. So there, there are new participants, there, there are, you know, the ones I've been used to see on every event, but it's a mixture of both. So it's, it's very good to see that happening. Uh, and it, it really gave me more and a lot more momentum uh, to participate in, in Cloud Foundry even more again. So in that, in that um, respect, it was a wonderful event. Event. I know what I'm going to say may not be very popular, but uh, I've seen events, they grow, communities, they grow, they become huge and massive. But I really miss those days when the communities and the event were smaller. You knew everybody, you walk into the room, you knew all 50 people, you have right discussions. When it comes too big, you cannot even, it's, it becomes too much noise. Can you talk about when you were at the event, what were some themed patterns, discussions that you heard or you were involved with, engaged with, uh, with the community? Well, first thing to say is it's not only the sheer number of people showing up at an event, it is especially what you just mentioned. It's the, the conversations um, that show whether there's a spirit or whether, you know, everybody's, uh, I don't know, somewhere, some, some, someplace else in the mind, but not at the conference, not in the topic. So the, the the conversations were a lot about um, you know the progress of Cloud Foundry at the same time also about classic Cloud Foundry because it's it's still being used at scale and, and you know we've been discussing this for for you know quite quite a few years now but when we talk about um, uh, Cloud Foundry in the classic stack the VM based Cloud Foundry with uh, existing customers um, having those large environments they're still very confident that this is the right solution for them. So um, when when Kubernetes became so <coughs> so ubiquitous a few years ago, I thought, well, classic Cloud Foundry will go away much quicker. But in fact, it doesn't. It, it, it came to stick and it came to stay. And that's exactly what it does because of its operational responsibility. So that that is absolutely uh, unbroken. At the same time, um, Cloud Foundry on Kubernetes appears to uh, conquer a different niche. It is, you know, much smaller. It allows uh, to to download and install a Cloud Foundry. You know, get that CF push user experience, use build packs, and and had all have all those, um, you know, wonderful aspects of Cloud Foundry, but at a large smaller infrastructure footprint. So in my opinion, the idea of on-demand Cloud Foundry environments or small-scale Cloud Foundry environments uh, with Cloud Foundry for Kubernetes is uh, Corfi, in other words, um, is just getting uh, more mature. And we are now at a point in time when, when using Cloud Foundry uh, based on Corfi is a thing, especially if, uh, if you have the prerequisites to meet uh, the current um, you know, applicability in that sense that uh, the environment won't get too big and that you don't need, uh, you know, all the features of the classic Cloud Foundry include its ability to, uh, you know, scale, uh, to scale out that much. When you're talking with the community, as you like, the discussion, the, the quality of discussion matter. So what are some of the where you like, these were the common themes that you saw uh, at, the, uh, at the event when you're talking to folks because, you know, uh, different uh, players, not players, but uh, different, you know, 
people came to to the event what were you like hearing and seeing there well naturally people talk to me about about topics that i'm known for so there's a certain resonance uh, in, in that respect i have to mention that there's a, there's a bias in my conversations uh, but um one of the topics still is how to manage data at scale um so you know the data service automation is is, is still an issue for many uh, companies developing application development platforms um, with Kubernetes becoming more important. You know, some of them are making experiments to run uh, databases on Kubernetes. Uh, some of them, they stick with the idea of, of virtual machines, which also is, is fine. And then, uh, you know, cross integration becomes an issue. So if, if you have some services on, on based on virtual machines, like we at, at Anynines do, uh, but also have data services on Kubernetes, such as we at Anynines do, you also have to think about uh, cross-integration. So how can you consume data services from uh, Kubernetes and vice versa? How can you consume Kubernetes services from a Cloud Foundry? So it's again, it's again about writing service brokers and uh, custom resource definitions in, uh, in the most and best meaningful way. So that's a topic that um, we've discussed um, which, you know, also uh, another interesting aspect is the depth of automation. Um, so let's say about let's let's talk about Postgres. It's uh, it's one of the the oldest data servers we automate. And uh, if you look at uh, at the depth th this automation has reached to this day, this is already pretty amazing. So um, let's say you move the first time to you know a manufacturing industry. There are different requirements than moving to towards a customer from the financial industry. Think about backups and the different policies you could implement with Postgres. So, um, you know, the more mature conversations of the more mature technologies, they are always about, well, how to push the edge of automation even further and get those edge cases, um, you know, covered uh, that haven't been covered so far. What kind of trends you are seeing when it comes to Cloud Foundry, Kubernetes, Spaceware, when you talk to these? So these are the things that are going into production. Uh, these are challenges we are o o overcoming. Of course, you mentioned query fee. Can you talk about that? You know, we recently spoke about uh, OpenStack as a community that has grown, you know, quite a lot. It has a lot of publicity. And and then, you know, OpenStack to some, to some degree um, has lost you know, the visibility in, in the broader tech community. But that, does that mean that OpenStack is gone? Absolutely not. Uh, we encounter OpenStack in many customer, ac customer accounts to this day. It, it has established um, as a technology. It is just that a lot of people had to accept that building your own Amazon in, in your own data center of choice isn't as um, cost effective or easy as as people may have hoped for and this hope that has been disappointed um, fueled uh, you know the, the openstack movement to the day when people realized oh it's it's happening but uh, you know under different constraints and uh, and that drove people away to look at the new shiny thing so to some sort and to some degree this is just the natural progress so just because people don't talk about cloud foundry the way they did in 2016 anymore it doesn't mean that cloud foundry is gone it's there and it uh, it's solid so i think that's that's absolutely fair and okay yeah, the best thing I mean, Linux kernel, right? Nobody talks about the kernel, but kernel is the backbone of modern economy. No matter you talk about AWS or Apple or Microsoft or Google or Tesla, you know, everything learns on Linux. So just because it's not shiny doesn't mean it's gone. Yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, you're right. Um, the Linux kernel is there to stay. It's a centerpiece, but even if you conquer a particular niche, you, you can, you know, have a very long lifetime in, in that niche as well. So if you, if you think about Kubernetes, for example, uh, I still believe that Kubernetes has cannibalized many different movements. So it got momentum from the OpenStack movement where it consumed those disappointed people who were looking for an infrastructure abstraction layer who don't want to deal with hardware um, and, and don't want to deal with proprietary um, you know, infrastructure automation API. So you have to deal with, look at Bosch CPI, for example. You have an implementation for OpenStack, 
for, for vSphere, for AliCloud, and for, for every major hyperscaler. Um, if, you know, that, that's, that's a lot of work. So do you really want to do that work as when you develop a, a, a automation framework for distributed systems? So if, if Kubernetes is ubiquitous and you can get Kubernetes on every infrastructure, you know, Kubernetes becomes infrastructure abstraction. And that's a movement that still goes on. And I think that's where Kubernetes has tapped into the momentum of, of the open stack community because you know, it was simple to, to get this momentum due to the, all this disappointment they, they stirred up over the years and they created over the years. So there was a vulnerability that came from the open stack movement that made them susceptible to uh, the advantage of, of a different movement. And if you think about Docker, for example, uh, you know, the pivot from being a platform company to having, you know, a, a container orchestra, a, a container technology, and then failing to establish a container orchestration tool at a, at a broader scale. That was, that, that execution, you know, it's simple for me to say it was a mistake, but, um, uh, it, it somehow, somehow Kubernetes got that, you know, position in the race. To, 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 to use Docker and, you know, do not conflict with the choice of the container technology, but still own the orchestration part of it. And so it, there's another movement Kubernetes tapped into. And at the same time, you know, they, they entirely decommercialized Kubernetes itself and, and, and forged it into become, you know, the prime standard of writing automation, de declarative cloud automation these days. So what is Kubernetes? Kubernetes is not de about deployments or stateful sets or replica sets. It today is about being the framework for writing declarative automation. And, and, and that's, that's, you know, Kubernetes became so much and that, that it is hard to say what it, what it is, you know, with one sentence. It, you can't. And that's why Kubernetes doesn't compete with Cloud Foundry. Kubernetes doesn't compete with Mesos. Kubernetes is is an ecosystem. It's you know it's a technology, but it's also the ecosystem. And and that's what people need to understand. Is uh, Kubernetes becomes what you need it to become, depending of, on a particular context. Because only with the context you can potentially determine what a Kuber, what Kubernetes is. Is it just a place to store apps or is it a place to run databases or is it a place to do event processing or whatever, analytics? Julian, thank you so much for taking time out today and sit down and talk about these topics. Thank you and I look forward to our next discussion. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for having me again. It's always a pleasure talking to you. And, uh, you know, your questions always uh, get me excited. So hopefully we're going to have more opportunity in the near future to talk about more exciting things.